to welcome comrades to today's meeting of the Oxford Communist Corresponding Society. Just briefly, I'll explain what the procedure is. Um, the meeting's going to start with an introduction by Ian here, who's uh, going to uh, talk for maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, something like that. Um, then I'll uh, invite people to ask any points of clarification or direct questions which permit a short, brief answer, and then I'll open it up for more general discussion. And then at the end, I'll give Ian a few minutes to respond to the discussion. So the title of the talk today is Abundant Theological Niceties, Power, Substance and Form in Marx's Theory of Value. So over to you, Ian. Thank you. Um, so I don't normally do uh, talks like this, which is you know, com commentary on, close commentary on Marx, because I, at least I think I try to make Marx ideas uh, more accessible in, in, in more sort of modern or language. Um, but this time I'm not, I'm, I'm, it's going to be full on Marxology, so apologies in advance. It's going to be um, close reading of, of part one of, of, of Capital, his theory of value. Um, I want to talk in particular about Marx's concept of abstract labour and how it relates to money. So some very fine distinctions that he draws I'll be talking about. And then I want to close with some remarks about how this relates to historical materialism. Um, the history of the meaning of abstract labour in Marxism has been fraught and controversial and continues to be. Um, so it does have, has had political implications. I did a poll on Twitter today. Uh, just put this in your heads before I start properly. And the question was, in Marx's theory of value, is abstract labor dot, 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 and people have four options. Is it trans-historical? Is it like a natural thing that transcends modes of production? Is it, is it only in capitalism, does abstract labor exist? Is it commodity production only? Or is it none of the above? And 571 people voted. It's very interesting, I thought. Uh, Trans-historical, 26%. Capitalism only, 27%. Commodity production only, 32%. <laughs> none of the above, 15%. So, um, and I think my followers are probably quite into Marx, uh, so people aren't, aren't really sure. So let me um, let's frame it from that point of view. <laughs> okay, so let's go. So Marx's theory of value, as some of these things you, 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 you know, I'll be teaching my grandmother to suck eggs, but um, Marx's theory of value is about a historically determined mode of production, which he calls um, commodity production. Uh, where private entities produce goods, not for direct use, but for sale in a market. So just think of a market economy. Commodities are useful articles. He calls them use values because they're produced to satisfy an anticipated social need. In the markets, commodities exchange in certain ratios mediated by money. And so commodities have exchange values with each other. And the famous example is one coat exchanges for 20 yards of linen. That's an exchange value between those two commodities. But exchange values, as Marx says, vary with time and place and appear to be something accidental and purely relative, lacking any intrinsic or necessary connection to the commodities themselves. So one purpose of any theory of value, not just Marx, any theory of value is to explain what exchange value is. And Marx argues that exchange value is, his words, the form of appearance of a content distinguishable from it. And that content Marx calls value. It's a technical term not to be confused with our ordinary uses of that word. Every commodity then, in addition to being useful and exchangeable, has this hidden property, its value. 
So value is that which manifests in this observable form of exchange value. But we can't observe it. We can observe use value. I know the use value of a coat just by looking at it. We can observe exchange value, one coat exchange for 20 yards of linen. We see that happening. We can observe that. But, quote, however we may twist and turn a single commodity, as we wish, it remains impossible to grasp it as a thing possessing value, end quote. So why isn't value directly observable? It's because value is a social property, not a physical one. So, for example, a fragment of wood counts as being in check when it's recruited into the social practice of playing the game of chess. You can't find the property of being in check within the wood itself. In the same way, a use value counts as value only when it's recruited into this social practice of a market economy. And although a commodity has value, its value isn't physically embodied in it. But what is uh, this value that Marx is talking about? Uh, and this is um, his deduction, essentially. <clears throat> so use values differ in quality, but the exchange value only differs in quantity. And since value is the content that appears as exchange value, it must be a homogeneous quality, which is common to all commodities, capable of quantitative variation. And he argues, and I'm not going to step into the merits or lack of merits of this particular step, but he argues that if we disregard use value, then the only property that all commodities share is that of being the products of labor. So the homogeneous quality is therefore homogeneous human labor, or as he says, human labor in the abstract, which we'll abbreviate to abstract labor. So now we're going to face the abundant metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties that Marx mentions in rapid succession. There's, there's a lot all at once in the first part of Capital. It's, it's difficult. Engels complained about it. Marx admitted that it was. So a commodity is a twofold thing. It's a use value and a value. It's not, as Marx Subsequently says, it's not strictly speaking an exchange value because exchange value is a relation between one commodity and another of a different kind. So it's really just a use value and a value. So Marx notes that um, commodity producing labor also has a twofold nature that mirrors the twofold nature of the commodities. As use values, this coarsely sensuous objectivity, commodities are the products of concrete labor in a specific form. His examples are tailoring and weaving and you know, with a definite aim. So you're trying to make a coat, you're trying to make some linen. But as values, which he you know, calls it a phantom-like objectivity, I've talked about that before, as values, commodities are the products of abstract labor. So this twofold nature of labor, according to Marx, is crucial to an understanding of political economy, end quote. So we'd all better pay attention when Marx says something like that. So... Thinking about chess again, if moving a chess piece is a twofold act, it's a physical move and it's a chess move. And the physical movement acquires an additional meaning within that context of the game. So this is um, a property of, of social practices in general. Our social practices assign roles and properties, new roles and properties to the people and objects that get recruited to fulfill those roles. And Marx says, here's a quote, just as some men count for more when inside a gold-braided uniform than they do otherwise, end quote. You know, it might be dressed up all fancy and people might think you're the king. So pay attention to that word uh, count because I'm going to use it a lot. So similarly, our work, when we're participating in the social practice of a market economy, acquires additional properties or meanings, it counts as abstract labor. Our work is not concrete and then by some causal process becomes abstract. Instead, 
the expenditure of human labor power simply has this twofold nature in that kind of practice. So what is abstract labor? What is this abstract labor? Well, all commodities, when viewed as values, are products of abstract labor. Abstract labor, says Marx, is the value-forming substance. And here's a full quote from him. The labor that forms the substance of value is equal human labor, the expenditure of identical human labor power. The total labor power of society, which is manifested in the values of the commodities, counts here as one homogeneous mass of human labor power composed of innumerable individual units, end quote. And so Marx uses two Aristotelian terms here, substance and power. And power is a potential, it's a capacity to act, whereas a substance is the, the essence of a thing. It's what makes it what it is, and it's what endures through all its changing appearances. So the total labor power of society is, is a collective power. This power, when exercised, has a twofold character. It's both concrete and abstract. And it produces commodities with a twofold character, the use values and values. And the value-forming substance, abstract labor, is the exercise of just ordinary, everyday labor power, but counted as abstract, not concrete. And it's our social practices that achieve this counting, both qualitatively, and that we count this work as abstract, and quantitatively, by counting the quantities of this, this work as abstract. And that happens without anyone being aware of it. It's, it's a property of our social practice. And how this is, counting is achieved, I'll get to in a moment. So we made a little, little bit of progress there. We haven't yet found out what value is, uh, but value, whatever it is, um, it's not its form of appearance, which is exchange value. It's not that. And it's not its substance either, which is abstract labor. Uh, value is something else, again. Okay, so commodity producing work under its concrete aspect produces use value. The same work under its abstract aspect produces value. Another quote from Marx. Uh, human labor power in its fluid state, or human labor, creates value, but is not itself value. It becomes value in its coagulated state in objective form, end quote. So work is performed and the product is a commodity of value. And Marx's coagulation metaphor here is capturing the idea of a dynamic activity, which is abstract labor, yielding a static product, which is a value, a commodity of value. And commodities, therefore, are, quote, crystals of this social substance end quote, crystals of this social substance, the determinate amounts or quanta of abstract labor is condensed in a particular form of a commodity. So the total labor power of society is a, a collective potential. A division of labor is one particular actualization of that potential. Commodities as use values are products of this division of labor, but in contrast, Commodities as values are products of undivided labor, one homogeneous mass of human labor power that has the potential to be divided. So we now know what value is. Value is a quantum, it's an amount of abstract labor. It's the expenditure of labor power that can take any concrete form, which just so happens to have crystallized into a particular form. So value is a property of a commodity, a completed saleable use value. In contrast, the substance of value, abstract labor, is the laboring activity that created value. So lots of distinctions there. I'm sure it caused Marx a lot of sweat and pain to come up with them. Um, and he did rework this again and again. So now we know what value is. Let's turn to its, its magnitude. So Marx intentionally, if, if not helpfully, uses value both to refer 
to its quality and to its quantity. So a commodity is a value, it, is, it has that quality, and it has a value, it has a magnitude of value. The value is the magnitude as well. Just, so Marx assumes, uh, due to market competition, that all instances of the same commodity type have identical exchange value in the period of analysis. That's a completely fine assumption. In normal economics, it's called the law of one price. In fact, it's not true. The same commodities in the period of analysis sell for different prices. It's a simplification. It's not very important. Okay? He, just, he assumes that. So value is the content that appears as exchange value. So its magnitude is also, must also be identical for all commodities of the same type. So in consequence, um, unskillful and lazy workers who take more time compared to others, they don't produce commodities of higher value. And conversely, really efficient workers, they don't produce commodities of lower value. Instead, the magnitude of value is the, quote, the labor time which is necessary on an average, or in other words, is socially necessary, end quote. So the individual labor time devoted to the production of an individual commodity doesn't determine its value. Rather, it's the total social labor time devoted to the production of all commodities of the same type that determines their value. So uh, begin quote. All the linen on the market counts as one single article of commerce, and each piece of linen is only an adequate part of it. And in fact, the value of each single yard is also nothing but the materialization of a part of the quantity of social labor expended in the whole amount of linen, end quote. So labor has a twofold character. In consequence, the total concrete clock time expended is identically the total abstract labor time expended. But, begin quote, the individual commodity counts here only as an average sample of its kind, end quote. So we can make this very um, straightforward, actually. So say that um, Q commodities of the same type are produced uh, by firms with different productivity levels uh, with a total of L, L hours of labor time. Then, and after the fact, an ex post estimate of the socially necessary labor time is L divided by Q hours of labor time. And actually Marx performs that simple average in some of his examples. So uh, although value is hidden, although it's a social property of commodities, it's actually entirely matter of fact once we actually understand what it is. So the magnitude of value, this average labor time, is a property of the current conditions of production, the techniques that are in play, and the average degree of skill and intensity of labor prevalent at any time. So values are changing all the time as production conditions change. They're not constant. But as we said, value isn't a physical property of the commodity. It's a, prop it's a property of the conditions of production. So the value of an individual commodity sitting unsold on a shelf in a warehouse this value immediately changes if the conditions of production change. And that's not spooky action at a distance. So back to the chess game. Um, so the, the property of being in check, it's not in the king piece, but it's in the state of play, in the state of the board. So a, a player might move a, a completely different piece and immediately remove that king from being in check. So similarly, if, if new techniques are adopted that reduce the average labor time to produce a commodity, then the value of all commodities of that type falls, regardless of when they were produced or where they are. So just like the king piece, this property change is immediate. It's part of the, the meaning of, of the rules of this game. It's immediate change in that property. But the full causal consequences take time to play out. So Marx's conception of the magnitude of value as a property of the conditions of production doesn't change throughout all three volumes of capital, despite what some people may claim. Okay, so now that we know that value and its magnitude, what, what they are, uh, we can return back to its forms of appearance, which is actually the structure that Marx adopts in part one. Starts with the phenomena, goes to value, now goes back to explain the form of appearance. So commodity production, it, it's not barter, 
Instead, a money commodity, such as gold or silver, solves the problem of the coincidence of wants. Now, that's kind of like basic economics. Marx is no different here, though he doesn't use that phrase. So a money commodity, uh, like all commodities, enters the market with a value determined by its conditions of production. But unlike ordinary commodities, uh, money is not consumed, uh, but it continually circulates to facilitate its exchange. This money commodity serves as a material for the expression, the form of appearance of value, and because it directly ex exchanges against all commodities directly, it functions as a universal measure of value, and Marx calls it the god and king of commodities. So like the king in a game of chess, the money commodity is recruited by our social practices to play this special role. Uh, quantities of the money commodity become institutionalized, uh, as units of account or money names. So, as people know, the British pound gets its name from a standard weight of silver. Um, the nominal quantity of metal, say stamped on a coin, diverges from the actual quantity embodied in the coin. And this separation of money as a pure symbol from money as a special commodity that bears that symbol is, Marx explains, completely inevitable. It has to happen. So today... Uh, money is a pure symbol, but it has different material bearers, coins, paper notes, electronic bits. Uh, a sum of money, say £10, bears no relationship at all to the value of, of the physical bearer, the, the paper note. And so this separation is, is, is pretty clear now, even more so than it was when Marx was writing, where he assumes throughout part one and further that money is in fact gold. But he discusses this separation and this separation of the symbol from the material bearer. So I'm going to use money to mean, from now on, symbolic money, not its material form, pure symbol. That's what I mean by money when I use that word from this point on. Money is not a commodity. It has no conditions of production. It's not a crystal of abstract labor, and therefore it is not value. Money is merely a symbol that by virtue of our social practices refers to something else. So what does this symbol refer to? So money uh, can buy any commodity. Uh, it can buy any value. Money, therefore, doesn't refer to any specific crystal of abstract labor, but that which is common to all possible crystals. So in other words, money refers to the substance of value, abstract labor itself. And a quantity of money, say £10, refers to a quantity of abstract labor. So these numbers that control our lives, the pounds, the dollars, the euros, the social symbols, abstract totems of our collective power to perform work of any kind. And so we fetishize money, imagine it has magical powers, but those powers are really our own. So, for example, the average hourly wage in the UK is about £17 per hour right now. So one pound represents, on average, about three minutes of abstract labor time. And that possession of one pound confers on us the right to that labor time in the form of commodities for sale in the market. Marx doesn't have a commodity theory of money. He doesn't have a monetary theory of value. But he has a labor theory of money. All right, uh, let me now put all those concepts together. Um, in commodity production, our collective labor divides into different kinds of work, a social division of labor, producing different commodities. But as we've noted, our collective work also counts abstractly as undivided with the potential to perform any kind of work. It also counts as abstract labor. Producers with commodities and consumers with money enter the market. Commodities have money prices. Consumers, if they have the money, buy the commodities they want at those prices. That's what we see. That's obvious to everybody. But these acts have another hidden meaning, um, which we can now understand. 
the commodity has value, but the money lacks value. The commodity is a particular use value. The money is a universal use value. The commodity is an expenditure of labour power in concrete form. The money is an expenditure of labour power in abstract form. It's a representation of abstract labour. So in other words, in an exchange, a quantity of abstract labour in the form of a commodity is exchanged for a symbolic quantity of abstract labour in the form of money. So the actualized potential meets the potential unactualized to really compress it down. And in general, those two quantities are unequal because what is supplied uh, mismatches what's demanded and therefore commodity prices are not proportional to the commodity values. Market prices vary according to supply and demand and in acts of exchange, how our collective labour power is divided meets how it ought to be divided. And therefore, Marx's important distinction between value and value realised in the market. And the difference between those two things is a condition of possibility for economic crisis. It's not the cause, it just means that's why it is possible at all. Uh, the commodities flow to consumers and money in the reverse direction uh, flows to producers. And it's that monetary feedback which compels the producers to reallocate their labour power to the activities that are in demand, either by rewarding them with profits or punishing them with losses. So, without us being aware of it, we divide our collective labour power according to effective demand. And the law of value is that entire process. Without going into the details of it, it has an attractive state where society's labour time is optimally allocated. The quantities produced equal the quantities demanded and prices are proportional to values. And in that state, what ought to happen does happen. That potential is now adequately actualised. Now, that attractive state never empirically manifests, but it always influences the trajectory of market prices and everything else is changing all the time. So our collective spending determines the spending of our collective time. That's my attempt to summarise Marx's theory of value in part one, <laughs> as far as I could. So let me close now on some re remarks on the relationship between that theory of value and historical materialism. So... A traditional debate uh, concerns which of Marx's categories are, are specific and which transcend modes of production, which I'm going to call which categories are modal, specific to a mode of production, and which are transmodal, which transcend modes of production. So, uh, as you know, historical materialism is not a naturalism because it recognises uh, the modality of social forms, their historical specificity. But neither is it uh, social constructivism, because it recognises uh, transmodal invariants that partially account for the transitions between modes of production. And there's two points I want to make here. The first is that, that social forms can have natural content. And second, a form and content cannot just freely bind with each other. They have to be, in some sense, adequate to each other. So, for example, again, in chess... The king is a small object of wood or plastic with an iconic crown. But if we lose that piece, uh, then we can use a coin, a stone, or you know, a bottle cap, something else. Something else may do. This, the category king here is this social form, and various physical objects may serve as its content in that game. But not any object. Tea mug would be far too big. A grain of sand would be far too small. Liquid would be no good at all. So form and content must, must fit each other, uh, be mutually adequate to some extent. Um, so if we consider exchange value, so many ancient and uh, contemporary communities, they produce and use, use, use objects, but without any exchange value. So exchange value is clearly modal. 
it's specific to a market economy. But uh, actually, Marx makes this point. Any use value can actually play the role of an exchange value. So even non-commodities that lack value altogether, such as land, uh, unique objects, even con our conscience can have a price. Now consider uh, value. Value is a property of a commodity that regulates the exchange value. So that's also modal. It's completely linked to the phenomena of exchange value. But what about the substance of value, abstract labor? So substance, as we noted, is an Aristotelian term that denotes an enduring essence that transcends its particular forms. So the enduring essence is our, our power, our capability to socialize into any division of labor and perform any kind of work. Now Aristotle, when he was observing early commodity production, uh, didn't recognize abstract labor because ancient Greece society was a slave-earning society with a rigid division of labor. You know, slaves might spend their entire lives doing one type of work. You might be a galley slave and spend all your time rowing. So in this mode of production, labor was recruited by uh, social forms which appeared exclusively concrete. Uh, human potential, potential was, was blocked. It wasn't fully realized. And significantly, from this point of view, the, the problem of economic value wasn't thoroughly posed until the rise of capitalism with its increasingly varied and changing division of labor. So in commodity production, concrete labor counts as abstract labor. In consequence, it takes a value form, ultimately a money form, which is this mighty social abstraction. Our labor can play this social role because it has the potential to perform any kind of work. But not anything can play that social role. So animals and machines, because they can only perform some kinds of work cannot count as abstract labor. And that is why money refers to our work and not theirs. And we began to recognize our abstract powers at a point in history when our social forms began to adequately express them. But our use of money and the commodification of labor power that occurs with capitalism didn't, didn't create those powers. Instead, it represented them and actualized them. Up to that point, they were potential. So abstract labor, then, is a transmodal category. It's not actually an abstraction, but it's the exercise of abstract power. And I think it's fine to assert that, and there's no need to say that there's any kind of fixed uh, human essence, because what are abstract powers truly are, is open. It's something to be discovered by social forms that enable their full expression. So taking a, a broad sweep, uh, historians in the room can criticize me later, uh, the rough succession of modes of production from ancient to feudal to modern is the history of our substantial powers discarding the old and finding new, increasingly adequate social forms. And capitalism... Uh, with its drive to unnecessarily intensify and prolong compelled work also blocks the full exercise of our powers. So we're always playing these economic games with each other, but if, if we want to play the role of God and king and not money, then we'll have to change those rules. So um, I'll stop there because that's enough theological niceties for, <laughs> for a day. Thanks. <coughs> Okay, so does anybody have any points of clarification or brief questions to Theo before I open it up to more general discussion? No? Well, I think that's a bit of a first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay, well, if nobody has any questions, then um, more than comments, points that people want to make. Um, I voted transhistorical. Is the, is the, I mean, Dr. Robbins in Crucial is now about that he's got various concrete labour. An individual carries out more than one concrete labour. So 
labor as such. He's got his labor as such, is that? Is that not? It seems kind of. It seems to absolutely just labor as such, if you call abstract labor that, then even an individual is different labor, so it doesn't seem to be a specific <coughs> thing more. Can I uh, just have a brief comment then, if nobody else has, which is, um, I mean, firstly, I, uh, I have to thank you, Ian, for clarifying a, a misconception that I've had for, well, decades, it's, it, it must be now, um, which is that I always thought, that, um, I mean, Marx talks about use value and exchange value, but the, the phrase value itself, I thought, was synonymous with exchange value but it turns out that it's not um, from what you say. Uh, so I'm grateful for that clarification, and it's something which I don't, I, I can't say that I fully understand it, because it's something which I've got to think about now. Um, the other thing which I'm slightly confused about is that value is created by, um, by, by human labour or abstract labour, um, But that doesn't necessarily mean that all labour creates value, or does it? Because I can imagine um, some guy digging a hole in the ground, putting the earth back into the hole, digging it out again, putting it back, digging it out again, putting it back. Does that count as labour? Um, and if it does, then it seems to me that no value is being created. So although that... Although the creation of value requires human labour, human labour, if that counts, if it, if, um, if, if it, it seems to me that human labour, um, depending on how it's defined, doesn't necessarily create value. I don't know if that's a comprehensible question, but my... It's a sort of one of the issues of that, that Marx, at least an example Marx gives, a woman who sings um, my washing up is not my singing creating value. But if she sings for an employer, she is by singing creating value. Um, but that's um, have we really got pure token money? Um, one level, I keep you. Jaris Banerjee, uh, Gold Labour and Aristocratic Dominance, it's a book about the um, late antique economy. Uh, and he's essentially arguing that the late antique economy is much more marketised uh, than we think. It's a problematic book because he comes very close to being a marginalist, and I just think marginalism is not really defensible. Um, but one of the points he makes is you can, you can trace the velocity of circulation of money by the level of wear in the hordes. And so the point is that the gold, silver and copper money just wears out. Uh, and in fact, uh, that's true. I've got um, lurking in my, somewhere in my attic a um, bunch of old pre-decimalisation coinage um, uh, from my grand's house. And the old Victorian coppers are worn to the point that it's very hard to make out uh, the, the surface appearance. Uh, the other side of this coin, and I cannot now remember whose argument this is, but it's uh, Burke was writing about to the monetary systems of um, uh, Roman Empire and Tang Dynasty China. And um, the point that he makes is that you can do it, it, it Tang Dynasty China uses brass as the principal medium of exchange. Uh, the Roman Empire, say, um, gold, silver, brass, and copper. Uh, um, but the point that he makes is that um, the 
once the commodity, the money commodity is monetized, is made into a money commodity, that has consequences that you can't, the extent to which you can vary the seigneurage, the, the, to, the face of the token value, the uh, production value is more limited than uh, at first sight appears. Because if you vary it too much from uh, it's, what you get is massive levels of forgery. Um, and uh, the uh, consequence that the, um, or the clipping we got in late late 17th, 18th in, in century England, uh, clipping the edges of the coins and melting down to make uh, addition, so, uh, additional silver. Um, And the other side of this coin took an act of parliament in 1727. Before the act of 1727, the courts took the view that theft of a £10 banknote is uh, theft of the paper value, which is, uh, and therefore petty larceny, which is <laughs> whipping as opposed to grand larceny, which is theft of more than a shilling's worth of property. Uh, is capital punishment. And so we get an act of, have, we need an act of parliament to make uh, banknotes count for criminal liability for the face value of banknotes to count. And indeed there's a whole raft of, there's a, there's a mass of um, conflicting case law uh, in the 18th century about private banknotes. And if, you do, if, if I pay with a private banknote and the bank goes bust before the payee presents it for, um, uh, 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 for payment, yeah. uh, the judges tended to take the view that the uh, payee was entitled to recover the price, the, the, the value from the payor. Um, uh, unless they immediately left their shop and went to the bank for payments and found the bank bust. Um, but the uh, city merchants who sat on the uh, commercial juries, special juries, tended to take the view that the handing over the bank note was payment. And the, the, the courts and the city are fighting over this all through. So the, my point here is that the Making the, the token into um, a token of value, um, into a money token, a paper money, it involves not just a, 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 a habitual practice among uh, exchanging parties, but a, a social practice which involves fights. And I guess the same is true, but it's fairly clearly the case. It, it, two sides of this, one of which is it's not clear that gold, it's clear that silver has been demonetized, that the price of silver is governed by its industrial uses. It's not clear that gold has been demonetized. Um, and conversely, it's not at all clear that Bitcoin is money for any of these, these things. Yeah. Uh, so it's a sort of uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite strong, I'm persuaded by your point that the idea of abstract labour itself is transhistorical, is transmodal, yeah. uh, as opposed to there are various people who say you only get trans abstract labour in capitalism, that it's because of the dynamics of capitalism that labour becomes abstract. So it's better to say your, your point that it's it's because of the dynamics of capitalism we're able to perceive labour as abstract. Yeah. Um, in the same ways, it's because of the dynamics of capitalism that we're able to perceive the economy at the foundation of um, social order in some respects. But um, at the same time, I'm not the, 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 the money thing. It seems to involve something more complicated. Sorry, that's been rhetorical. 
Um, anybody else? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. And very uh, interesting, enlightening talk. I did vote in your poll and I voted commodity production. Um, and I'm not going to attempt to defend that. Um, I suppose. Um, I don't think it is not self evident to me that. In a slave society, it looks as though all the labor is fixed into certain roles. Because even a galley slave, in fact, people might be sent to the galleys as a punishment for something, and they wouldn't have always been a career galley slave. There might be some societies where there would be something like a caste system and an attempt to enforce that you have a, a job for life or a hereditary job for life. But I think it would also, in a lot of slave systems, seem as though these are the slaves and you tell them what to do. And you say, go over there and do that, or go over there and do that. Um, and in ancient, I mean, the quotation of Heraclitus that gets brought up in this context about um, all things change into fire and fire changing into all things, or whatever it is, like all things are exchanged for money, and money is exchanged for, for all things. Um, so with that, it is, it's something like commodity exchange mediated through money that he's using to see. Um, but as I say, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to drive far down that road. I was interested by what you were, by what you said, about the symbols, tokens, chess pieces, which in some ways connects to what we were talking about in a previous meeting about uh, card games, because a five of clubs is a symbol that you could in principle. Now you probably couldn't, it would not be an adequate symbol to say this piece of note paper that I've written five of clubs on is the five of clubs, because it wouldn't, it, it would be physically immediately distinguishable from the other cards. So that would be an issue of the, of the adequacy of the symbol. But it's only within a certain formal practice like a chess game, it's only in terms of the rules of chess that the bottle top is just as good as a, as a king. Um, and in... in day-to-day -day experience, those sorts of symbols go backwards and forwards between being the, between purely being a symbol that has a role within a, within a formal system and any adequate object can play that role, and being a nice, attractively designed, nicely carved chess piece that you're pleased to have, or a rubbish and cheap one that you don't mind losing or whatever it might be. Um, and the same is true of words, which are symbols that in some kinds of language, words are formal tokens, and you ignore whether or not they rhyme, and whether it's a long word or a short word, and whether it sounds like another word. But in another form, of, in another in another linguistic context, for example, in poetry, then the fact that it rhymes or the fact that it sounds like another word, which are facts about the material symbol, they're facts about the sound waves that it produces, those then become relevant again, and you couldn't replace it with another word that's a synonym, which is why those forms of language are difficult to translate, because a word that means the right meaning in another language won't necessarily have what well, it won't sound the same, otherwise they'd be the same language. It won't sound the same, it won't have the same rhyming patterns and so on. So uh, <clears throat> and I I wonder how often we do in fact succeed in using symbols in the pure symbolic formal role. Card games are probably a fairly close example of it. Um, mathematical notation is quite a good example. 
where it really doesn't matter what shape, you know, the so-called Arabic numbers can do Arabic numbers. The actual symbols for zero to nine are different shapes in the Arab world, they're different shapes in India, there are different variants. And those are exactly those are exactly as good as each other. Um, and it would really be fairly meaningless to say that's a better shape for the number three than this other shape. All they need is to be distinguishable from, from one another. Um, and shapes of the of the arithmetic operators, why should a plus be that and a multiplication sign be? Uh, a different cross, um, as long as you can distinguish them from each other. And people do, I don't think many people use a different symbol for plus, but for multiplication, different symbols can be used. For division, different symbols can be used. For multiplication, in some contexts, you know, algebra, you can just use juxtaposition and write x, y. But for writing numbers, that then isn't adequate because you can't put two times three just by writing them next to each other because you're writing 23. Um, but those symbols, arithmetic operators, they have particular inventors. And I forget the name of them, but you know, somebody invented the plus sign, somebody invented the St. Andrew's cross multiplication, somebody invented the equal sign. Um, the symbols that we're most familiar with that we use all the time, which are which are words, I don't think ever quite get to the point of being pure formal tokens. Um, I'll stop there. Yeah, just to um, <clears throat> go back to the point that you made, Zed, um, about labour. Um, so, if capitalism arises out of contradiction between sort of bourgeois social relations, which is labour, um, so the key point in that would be it's a social relation, labour, and it's that contradiction between bourgeois social relations and industrial forces of production that allows capitalism in the first place. So we're sort of wrestling with that contradiction in capitalism, but I guess. I, it, yeah, we'd need clarification on is labour a social relation, I guess, in order to answer that. It's just digging a hole, like, and filling it back in useful in a social context. It's labour. Mm. Yeah. Kind of abstract labour, shall I say. Yeah, it's it's uh, not socially necessary. Mm. It's not socially necessary, though. Mm. Yeah. Well, but is there a hard and fast defining line between socially necessary labour and a waste of time? Mm. I'm not sure that's what I used to get at. Quite a lot of Marx's usage of talking about unproductive labour is piss taking. Because the capitalist economists talk about unproductive labour. They tend to regard everything the, the state employees do as unproductive. Uh, mm. Preaching ministers of religion. Uh, but there's also another level of it, whereas, it, 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 from the point of view of particular, from the point of view of the global economy, the activity of priests and religion adds nothing to the sum of use. Priests and ministers of religion adds nothing to the sum of use values. But if you're uh, a, you're at Canterbury. Um, and there's a whole raft of tourists who come either in medieval times or in our own times to see the cathedral and uh, the, the, the priests and ministers of religion. Then, from the point of view of the local economy, you've attracted a whole load of use values in from outside in the form of the money which the tourists bring in. So, mm -hmm. that things could be unproductive from the standpoint of the global economy, but actually highly productive from the standpoint of a national economy. Or a local economy. Uh, so that it becomes sort of fluid and difficult. Mm. Um, Is that right that ministers?
uses of religion don't produce new strategies. And I can see that they don't generally produce value because people don't often pay for it. But a sermon, if people in, enjoy listening to a sermon, which is how you use it, how is that different from consuming any other service? Yes, that's an interesting point. But it's free, isn't it? It's, not it's free, so it's so it doesn't it doesn't have value. It doesn't have an exchange value. It doesn't yeah. have a price. But as a use value, um, which you know, Coke has a use value even if I didn't pay for it, um, and something. You know, if you uh, if you make something to use yourself, or make it to give as a gift to somebody, without any intention that it will ever be in a market, then it's still a use value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If 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 you can if you use it, or you enjoy it, or you get some benefit out of it, then it's a use value. Um, but it's not a it's not a value. And I would say a sermon is like is like that. I mean, it's not it's not different from a play where I would pay for a ticket. Um, and the work that the vicar does delivering the sermon. Um, but in fact, you usually do pay. You could not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you might you might you might pay, but you. But you probably you can go along and listen to it for nothing in a way that you can't go to a play at the theatre and and listen to it for for nothing. But I would have thought it's still it's still a use value if any service is a is a use value. Even if I don't enjoy it, even if I'm only there to show my face, and because I want to seem like a respectable uh, member of the religious community, then that's still a benefit that I'm deriving from the, from the service. I'm still using it for the purpose I want to use it for. Mm. Yeah, why they started the, 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 the classic political economist Adam Smith and contemporaries and predecessors did tend to regard the religious operations as being uh, unproductive. Now, um, the reason why they did so was because they thought that uh, if we looked at uh, societies which had uh, lots of religious practitioners, now, uh, the funds which were being applied to support the large numbers of religious practitioners would not be applied to um, mm, 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 the production of material commodities. Yeah, so that you've got uh, um, the perception that's all, all already there in the Neapolitan writers of the 18th century that our country is poor because there's too many fucking priests. <laughs> yeah, that may have been true. Um, I think I would take productive and unproductive labour to be wouldn't I to be productive and unproductive of surplus value? That it's an un, it's unproductive labour if an employer is not able to get anything out of it. Whether, whether or not it produces anything, whether or not it produces, I wouldn't take it to be unproductive of use value. Yeah, that's probably right. Mm. Any more? You know, um, which I've never really understood the thing about um, non-commodity money. How money money becomes a, a symbol. So money is a symbol. That the money material is what started with, with gold. But do you think there's a danger that if you start, it becomes so immaterial money that it's not really got value itself? Um, in a way, the symbols. If there's a crisis. People don't want the symbol. They want the real thing, there's something underneath it. And that often that gets missed, so that really, un, you know, if things get bad, people want cash. And then if cash is, you know, inflation, they want something lower than that. There's a, there's a sort of hierarchy of it. 
And I wonder sometimes if it, talking about money as a symbol becomes just cut off from, from reality, which then becomes very real and yeah, precious when there's um, when you need cash. Mm. But there's a sense in which it, it's cash if the state will take it in payment of taxes. Yeah, if you can actually buy something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so they. Yeah. So that it, it, in that sense, as long as the paper is. is I suppose this is the point about hyperinflation in Zimbabwe and Germany in the 1920s and stuff like that. that if the foreign creditors cease to accept the state's paper, then the consequence is that everybody in the country will no longer accept the state's paper. Yeah. And uh, the state's paper then ceases to be money. Uh, but whatever's the you know, that's like that it was normal a state currency, but it is a symbol of, of gold. Is it that it's a symbol of gold or yeah? Because it could be silver. Yeah, the England um, yeah. between oh God, for, for a very long time, the England the, the only cash money available in England was one was silver one penny one penny one silver penny. Yeah, and uh, all the other things like uh, shillings, pounds, and so on and so forth, all money in the camps was just one penny. The masses of these one penny coins. And get gold coins coming in late later in the Middle Ages and um, copper coins 17th century. Um, but that sense of we think of God, Marx uses gold as the example for gold. Uh, it, 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 uh, silver is far commoner as, uh, uh, as, the, uh, as the actual circulating money. You know what we call central London flats in London? Because they're just the things that people use to store value, mm -hmm. the property. I mean, I'm not. Yeah, but would you actually be able to universally use it to no, 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 no. universal exchange? It's a store of value without being a medium of exchange. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's certainly true that in a crisis, people might turn to precious metals or something like that. Like that, but they would also turn if there's a if there's hyperinflation in a particular state. Then I think a lot of people would just turn to another state's money that they trust. In Russia, when there was inflation in the 1990s, and people wanted dollars and Deutschmarks and yen and things like that because they believed that those would keep their value. And up to a point, those even circulated as money within Russia that they would be accepted. You couldn't pay taxes in England, but they would be accepted in shops until the authorities tried to crack down on and tried to crack down on advertising prices in dollars because they thought that's the ruble being driven out of its function as, as money. Um, and so, for a time in Russia, all prices in everything were advertised in conventional units, which meant dollars. But you weren't allowed to actually pay in dollars, but the price would be three conventional units. <laughs> and that meant <laughs> enough rubles to be three dollars at today's exchange rate. Um, but there are people who are just going to another symbol, but they're going to a they're going to an equally symbolic money. But one that they. But it's a symbol. Why is the US dollar the reserve currency? The answer is because the US Navy uh, is the yeah, is, is it controls world trade. And when the British Navy controlled world <coughs> trade, sterling was the reserve currency. Yeah. Um, um, before that, the Venetian ducat, um, the Reese dollar were, were international reserve currencies. Or a, or a token for world money. Yeah, token for world money. Yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah it, it's to do with the, with the power of the state that issued it. I mean, I think if the value of sterling collapsed, it might be the euro. People might 
use the euro in that role. To a certain extent in Russia, they used the Deutsche Mark in the 1990s. Um, people would have been certainly much happier to have Deutsche Marks than, uh, than, um, than rubles. One thing that was true in Russia at that time was that, and I don't know how this relates to anything, is that dollar bills were only accepted if they were physically flawless. If you had some scruffy dollar bill, nobody would take it. Um, although it is a symbolic token, but they wouldn't take it because they believed that nobody else would take it if it was a, or the bank would reject it when they tried to pay it in if it was a beaten up, scuffed one. English state in the medieval period confiscated all foreign money uh, on entry and issued sterling in exchange for and then actually they melted down and restructured the English state in the Middle Ages. Uh, Lots of states still require you to declare any foreign currency when you're going in um, and then declare what you're bringing out again in terms of foreign currency. But it's the consequence of that is the fact that sterling is the hardest currency in the Middle in the Middle Ages, because again, okay, because the state controls the purity of it, uh, whereas most European countries, the mints were not state mints, but were the mints of a particular city. Or, um, but there's no way the way things are is. Basically, money is just transfer. You know, you see how military has a really quick change, like becoming cashless, and that you've got this. It's just sort of just messages and, and computers and stuff. You can see how. I, I just wonder what people think money is. You know, just you know, people what, what you know. It's kind of very hard to to sort of um, to to to, um, to relate it to to labour. You know, it becomes so it's so out of touch now that you know you don't even it's not you don't you don't make money by working hard, for instance, anymore. And, and money is just kind of this crazy stuff in computer screens and your phone and whatnot. Um, but but also I think you know, Marx did trace it all back to the money material, whatever that gold or whatever that was. And some people now don't agree that so much, but NMT or whatever that you've got that you, that's not the case. I just think it's a big question. So, I mean, I'm not mm. I just think that Mar Marx did have a, he grounded it in something, and a lot of the, the current theories about like capital itself are kind of like very ungrounded. You know, money just sort of goes around and stays there rather than actually in concrete. Mm. I'm not just going off on here. Anybody else before I? ask Ian to come back. Um, one question, I've, I don't know how relevant this is to this actual talk, but I've always wondered how people sort of make money out of risk and options and sort of futures trading and how if capitalism is at risk, ironically people will get rich and get money out. Yeah, interesting question. Well, I'm not totally <laughs> sure it is relevant to this, but if Ian wants to address it, he can. Um, anybody else? Which is just a chip into this. There was a judge in the early 1850s uh, who argued that uh, um, it, it, there was no difference between financial futures transactions and putting money on the horses, mm. uh, and therefore it had the same legal consequences as putting money on the horses. It was a game of wager. Such a <laughs> okay, any more? If not, then I'm going to ask Ian to respond to that discussion in a moment. But before I do, I just want to announce uh, next week's meeting, which is going to be somewhere here in this building, maybe in this same room, 
maybe in another room in this building, but it'll be in this building somewhere. And the title of next week's meeting is 15 Minute Cities from East Berlin to the Hunger Games. <laughs> so, uh, 15 Minute Cities from East Berlin to the Hunger Games. I uh, invite you to come back for that one. And uh, over to you, Ian. You can respond to whichever points that have been raised that you'd like to respond to. Yeah, it was a really good discussion. Thank you. I listened intently to what every, everyone said. Um, so does all, all labor create value? No. Um, if I dig a hole and refill it again, I'm not producing a commodity for sale in the market. So it's, it's, it's irrelevant. If I set up a company that um, was the digging hole company and employ lots of people to dig holes and then ask people to pay us to do that, let's say random holes, then um, and we sold it on the market at a price, then their values, but they realize no value at all in the market. They don't realize any value in the market. And so it'd be rapidly eradicated from the system. It's not a use value for other people. <clears throat> um, Keynes actually, um, and he's, he's hated by this for the right wingers, said that um, in, in situations of uh, low employment, the state could employ people to do anything and pay them, including digging holes. Um, yeah, so the actual um, the actual nature of the labour is irrelevant. It's whether it's a commodity for sale in the market. Um, that's important. That's the social practice. In society, there's lots and lots of social practices going on all the time and they in, in, interlink and affect each other. Um, part one of capital is an abstraction. It's about social practice considered almost in isolation, which is the social practice of commodity exchange uh, and, um, and, and markets. Um, the question about the hierarchy of money and in crisis things falling back to harder forms of money like gold, for instance. Um, as I said, it's that, that is true. But what is incredibly powerful about Marx's analysis, and that's why I think it elevates his theory of value beyond anything else um, in the history of economics, even to the present day, is that his theory of value explains what, what money is if we pay very careful attention uh, to what he's saying. And... He actually says um, the problem isn't why a particular commodity is money, like, and he takes the piss out of other classical economists of his time who just bang on about, well, gold is divisible and it's, it's, there's not much of it and you can carry it around in your pockets and all that kind of stuff. He says, no, that's not, that's not the problem. The problem is to explain how commodi a commodity can turn into money. And in my talk, I, I, I skipped a huge number of pages where he starts with um, simple exchange of two commodities and then thinks about the, the world of exchange of commodities and then thinks about one commodity then becomes conventionally the one where all the other commodities express the value in its body and then that becomes uh, sanctified as a money commodity. The point being is that there isn't actually one money commodity. As, as you said, gold isn't even special. It, it, you know, silver can, has done the job. There's, there's multiple money commodities. The money is a symbol of what's hidden. And what's hidden is the expenditure of labor. And there are some kinds of commodities that are, are indeed particularly well suited to play that social role. For example, gold for the kind of properties that have been mentioned. But it's, it's nothing intrinsic to gold itself. And so, you know, that's why money can be bits stored in, in, a, in a computer. 
Um, because what's the important function is that it serves as the universal representative of abstract labor. And in that sense, the, the, the material bearer of that symbol becomes unimportant. You asked, um, do we really ever have pure token money? Um, no, of course we don't, because any symbol has to be materialized in some form or, or another. Even bits it's in, in, in storage in, in, on hard disks and databases, they require some energy. There is some actual value to that material bearer, that symbol, not that it's very important, anyone cares about, but there is some, even paper notes, they have value because they're produced. Um, but that's why I emphasize the, um, the symbolic nature of it, to focus on the fact that it, it, is, it functions as a pure symbol. And if it's directly accepted in all exchanges, then it, it functions as money. In cases where the, um, a particular form of money loses, people lose faith in it, and um, inflation, whatever, people will turn to other um, kinds of commodities that can um, like go back to gold or what have you, to then become that symbol and play that role in, in circulation. Um, Bitcoin isn't money. It's actually a commodity with value because um, the, the mining is actually a, a clear um, uh, production process and the output is uh, the mining of more Bitcoin. It's actually commodity money, Bitcoin. Uh, but it, I don't think, you, well, I said it is commodity money. I should have said it is a commodity and it isn't really money because it's not universally accepted in payment. You know, it's, it's, it's just not. Um, it's like some other kind of, kind of commodity that can be a store of value over time. Um, of course, um, money becomes involved in other social practices like the state and taxation. Uh, taxation creates forces demand for a particular currency. So sovereign power will demand tax to be paid in their currency. That gives them, uh, creates demand for that currency, allows them to impose it on a, on a community. Um, and it allows them to, um, to you know, on occasions, print it. If you have control over the symbol, uh, then you can, you can print it, you can create more of it, and essentially you're indirectly taxing everyone who, who holds it, and you can pay your army directly and do this and that, and it's a great way to um, have power over society if you can control um, money in that sense. But that, that's not what um, Marx's theory of value and his theory of money is addressing. Um, these are the social practices that can recruit um, the money symbol. Um, so... Ed, you were talking about the ad I think you were talking about the adequacy of symbols and whether the actual material form remains important uh, compared to its purely function. And that's the same top thing I'll kind of discuss here, which is yes, of course, the material form still kind of matters to some extent, but the more important phenomenon is, is, is the formal symbol itself and its function. In, in society and one thing that um, generalized commodity production the fact that our labor power is a commodity in the market now the fact that everything is monetized and the value form predominates um, has allowed us to see our abstract powers more clearly and our ability to organize ourselves in an evolving division of, of labor. But um, it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't follow that um, the money form is an adequate representation of, of, of our labor of, or, or what we are at all. It, 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 it kind of it actualizes and, and, and brings into reality something that is a power that we have. 
But it's not necessarily the only powers that we have, or even the most important powers that we have. And for, I, I listened to a podcast, um, a, a biologist, about um, se- uh, human cells. Now, human cells in, in, our, in our body um, do lots of useful things, uh, incredible amounts of useful things. But his work was to actually take them out of the body and look at them in isolation. And what is really surprising is that the cell in isolation has more powers and more varied powers than it manifests in the context of a body where it has a particular role to play. And in fact, what's amazing is that um, cells can essentially innovate, learn new things that they cannot have inherited through their DNA if they're put into novel environments. And the point there is that... um, when you're part of a, a unity like we are, and we're channeled into doing certain kinds of things, you, that you can might be mistaken in thinking that that is truly what we are. Uh, in other, maybe future social environments where there's a lot more kind of flexibility in how we can um, spend our time, we might be surprised by um, the kind of things we do. And in fact, the the fact that we can perform any kind of work and we can replace each other in the division of labour may become truly unimportant. Um, One, uh, there's so much to say, I I can't take it all. It's all very interesting. I I don't want to ramble on either too much. Um, You asked about, this one I can answer more easily, the futures trading thing and uh, the financial activity we see where people are betting on the stock market, um, um, exotic contracts about what may happen in the future, I don't know, this condition or that condition, someone will... The best way to look at that is, um, I think, like a, z- a zero-sum game. It's a game where people play together with money and simplifying somewhat. Um, no money's coming in, no money's coming out. Untrue, but to simplify. And they play each other and... At the end of a round of the game, the money gets redistributed and some people have more and some people have less. And the game they play is that if there's a high volatility in any particular price of anything, um, volatility is something they can exploit by you know, buying low and selling high repeatedly again and again at high frequency. And, and um, on one side of the coin, there is a small amount of merit it hardly, hardly exists the way they do it. But there's a small amount of merit in reallocating capital quickly to areas which are profitable uh, because reallocating capital to things that ultimately um, make a profit indirectly does reflect an actual demand that people might have subject to their budget constraints and subject to capitalist exploitation extracting profits from the middle of the same thing. But th- there, is some, th- there is some rationality reallocating capital very quickly uh, but in general, it's just a complete waste of time, and they're just gambling off each other. And it's 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 an activity that is boring. Uh, has it's really boring. Some of the mathematics can be interesting, but it's a waste of people's talent. And um, if it was highly socialized, then we could achieve the good effects and get rid of all this complete waste wasted activity. I think. Um, but that's I think that's an uncon- uncontroversial thing to state in this room. <laughs> uh, I could go on more, but I'll stop there. So thank you very much. Cheers, everyone.